Um, so his books, novels and other books have been translated into 19 languages. Uh, JD, who wave, <laughs> longtime journalist, written columns for SF Gate and uh, Huffington Post, mm -hmm. has in, been involved in award-winning award films and artwork mm -hmm. shown at the Getty Institute, the San Francisco MoMA and the de Young Museums. And, uh, and Chandra, I just learned how to say that, Chandra Castleton, who's a screenwriter and producer for an award-winning film, a variety of award-winning films, including Full Grown Men, a dramatic comedy that won the Sundance Audience Award and we will be released online later this year. Um, and there's way more information on them. I didn't want to take up too much time. Uh, so please go to our website for that. And uh, Doug will also pre present a little bit today about his process. So I'm turning it over to you. Poe, you wanted to start? Please do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. So a little bit about our writers community in San Francisco. Um, the origin in 1994 was some writers coming together thinking, you know, sitting at home and writing all day, we're, we're probably never going to make it. And um, the novelist Ethan Kanan was making a decision. Did he want to, he just coming off his emergency room um, credentials, and he was like, am I going to be a novelist or am I going to be a doctor? And he's like, if I would be, I feel like staying at home is going to be torture for me as a career. Ethan Waters had been, at the time, he had been at Harper's Magazine in New York, um, seeing a place called, and worked at a place called the Writer's Room, where, where you were able to rent a carol, while just, oh, not long-term, just like while you're working on a project, and it was a nonprofit, and he was inspired. And we, along with um, Chandra's hub, husband, David Monroe, uh, and a couple others, Josh Cornbluth, uh, decided to just rent a flat and rent a kind of a residential flat and treat it like an office. And we never intended to be an institution, but we decided we, we needed, we had one more room to rent and we needed to find somebody and asking around, we couldn't find someone. So we thought, well, let's throw a party. And uh, someone put up a postcard put out a postcard and mailed it to everybody and they wanted to call it something. And uh, from another friend, he rented a room in my basement and he had a little sign up and he called it the grotto. So someone stole that name and they put it on the postcard. The legendary columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle saw it and said, what the heck is this? A bunch of writers creating a little bohemian get together place called the grotto. He thought it was more than it was. And he put it in his column and the party was mobbed with people. And we found Tessa Suter, our other first person renting with us. And it sort of became a thing when it wasn't intended to be, become a thing. It became a thing in people's minds, not in reality. In reality, we just paid the rent and split the rent. That was all it was for a while. But being San Francisco and very active city with the internet boom and everything going on. We kept being bumped place to place every couple of years. And in order to make it, keep it affordable, we had to get bigger and sort of share the rent across more people. And, uh, you know, from the early day, very, very early days, Sean was there very quickly. JD was there. We were moving around. Um, it got to a point where in the South of Market neighborhood, we had 33 offices, most of them being sort of split and shared. So we had a community, an active community of about 50 to 60 people, not quite on a daily basis, but you know, regularly coming in every week and people who had moved away or working from home, all, to, all told it was at the time this book started, which was 11 years ago, um, it, we maybe had an active community of 75 people. It went on to become an active community and still thriving today of 150 people or so. And it started to teach classes and all these wonderful things sort of came out of it. But it was on 
December 1st, 2010, that I got a letter, email from the editor at Chronicle Books. Her name was Sarah Malarkey. And I knew Sarah for a, a long time ago, and I knew that she was kind of a honcho at Chronicle. So if she was sending me an email, I better read it. And also, if she made me any sort of offer, it was legit. It was a very simple email. And it said that they had recently published a book called 642 Things to Draw. So it was a little sketchbook. And it was selling really well. It was just, they just had a couple months sales. And they're like, we want someone to do these writing prompts, 642 things to write about. Could the grotto community do that? Very simple email. And I called her and I said, you don't mean actually 642 things. You just mean some large number, like any large number would work, like 128 or 264, like just some random big number. And she was like, because I'm pretty sure we could do that. And she's like, no, like I want it to be consistent with the drawing book. So 642 things. And I was like, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, she offered us, I don't know, JD, do you remember? Was it 5000 or $10,000? It was do? like not much. It was 5000 I think it was three to yeah. 4000 Yeah. Didn't she have a deadline too? Oh, yeah. She, she had like, a deadline, but the deadline was was um, pretty quick, seemed pretty quick, like two months yeah. out. And we're like 642, then we have two months to write this book. And nobody like was taking ownership of the book. And, and if we all did it together, no, and we split the money, no one could really make much money on it. We didn't really know how to do it. So what I said is, look, I'll just pop it onto our email thread for the grotto. And if it looks like there's a lot of excitement and energy and we're getting, you know, some numbers, if we maybe we could get like 60 in the next day or 50 in the next day or two, then we could sort of say yes to doing the project. So I'm like, please give me 24 hours before we, we sort of before you offer it to anybody else. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back in time for a second, but 24 hours later, I said yes. Um, we'll definitely do this. We're up to about 300. <laughs> and literally one day later, I walked down the street, the entire manuscript of 642 things to write about. We collectively, you know, the, the challenge to do it was a writing prompt in and of itself. And people just came together on email and we turned in the entire manuscript in in essentially two days, is slightly less than two days. And it was such a flourishing, such a mm -hmm. exciting and creative brainstorm. It was really inspiring. And I think we were just started out thinking it's writing prompts, but to, to each of us, it kind of meant something different. And to me, I felt like writers often struggle with what should they write about? or all the good material is taken, or how do I find something different? And maybe they over-index on how their topic represents their writing rather than say the style and, and signature feelings of their writing. Uh, but, you know, we're people are just relentlessly creative. There's just, in, in, I wanted to, we wanted to create a feeling that there was in fact an infinite number of things to write about, that the things to write about will never all be taken. No matter how many books are written, not everything will have been said. And to give people inspiration and heart to just that aspect of their creative self, right? It, it didn't matter if you wrote any one of the 642 things. What would matter was that you could just browse it and it would stimulate all sorts of things in your own mind to remind you that we all have stories to tell. I think the other thing that um, when Poe was mentioning about how the process got done in literally a couple of days was the beauty of the whole concept of the writer's grotto. And that is that you're not writing alone. And one of the most powerful tools has been our listserv, has been our, our email communication. And so I remember at the time after he posted the prompt, he first posted three examples of his own, like 
like here's an example and and that started us prompted right like oh i can do i can do something like that i can think of some interesting prompt from my own life or inspired by someone else's life and then there came this sort of lengthy conversation over what 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 was it 48 hours though that once you did it that we did it but anyway there was this oh. conversation on the listserv between all of us saying how about this, where we actually sort of talked to each other and actually collaborated in terms of inspiring each other with our prompts and sometimes not even posting the prompts, but like posting a situation that would inspire other people to, to submit prompts. And I remember that was part of the fun was we were all responding yeah. to this prompt by coaching and inspiring and coming up with ideas for each other in real time. <laughs> For like a couple of days and then and then it was a contest that was the other really exciting oh. thing it's like i've already written 30 what are you guys doing <laughs> you know <laughs> and we would actually like compete against each other for our numbers and and that's one of the things that poe discovered when he looked back at the checks and because we all got you know a little bit of money for each prompt was i have to say i was the winner of the, <laughs> of the very first Sort of numbers in terms of submitting the most prompts for the first 642 and i was so so jazzed because i had the time free i happened to have the time free to just devote thinking walking around the house walking around the city what can i you know what kinds of things interest me what kinds of situations interest me what kinds of emotions what kinds of emotional situations have i gone through that are really interesting for me that that i both experienced or that i read about do, do either of you remember how many um how many prompts did you write because i know um poe yesterday you texted me that i earned a total of i think it was 64 dollars and 50 cents <laughs> for my prompts but i don't and then jd that you wrote the most but i don't, I don't i'll know. look it up while we're while we're talking okay i, I couldn't okay. find on my computer the original manuscript but it's somewhere in the email because i also emailed it to sarah but I found the accounting for it. And my memory is that the, the most was around, if that was JD, that was around 32. I mean, people wrote more, but we, we actually wrote- Oh yeah, right. Well over 800. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to, it took me about three hours, but I had to, I had to winnow it down to avoid um, ones that were just too similar. And we actually didn't, when people were writing them, they didn't just put them all into the listserv. What I asked was, to share them with me directly or Ethan and I, or maybe it was JD. And, and then we'd, we'd select some and send those back out to keep triggering the thoughts. But we didn't want to make people feel like everything was taken, right? Or that we also didn't want to make them feel like everybody else was do doing it. And so you could, you didn't have to try. Uh, we respected the fact that a lot of people had assignments and deadlines to meet. They couldn't do as much, but uh you know it kind of spiraled in a really wonderful way but i'll look up i'll look how many people did i i think it was something like five dollars a prompt <laughs> that we ended up paying people which um is interesting given um poe you pointed out that it's sold something like over seven hundred thousand copies yeah eight hundred thousand copies now <laughs> yeah. <Around the> world. <laughs> and and then spawned 642 tiny things to write about a teens version 712 more things to write about it spawned six progeny collectively having sold about two million copies and uh yeah the um 642 things for kids to write about is something that um a lot of people have talk to me about my my daughter used and that's a really good one i'm really curious doug how you stumbled across the book and um i mean i, I honestly i've never heard of someone um having a, a prompt book as a as a favorite book so i really want to hear about your story well it book. was given by a person that's online now i think Ginny gave it to Catherine Brown. And I'm just going to say that's what happened at a birthday party for Catherine. And I saw it and said, oh my God, I, oh, she's just now coming on, Catherine Brown. 
I said, oh my goodness, I want that. So I ordered it from Gallery Bookshop in Mendocino. And um, I didn't take off right away using it. But uh, anyway, yeah. When, when was that? How long have you been? Well, I've been at it for um, eight months now, solid. Yeah. Wow. One every two weeks, pretty much. I've written about this. I've, I've had it set up. Uh, I, I was given some time to, to talk about this, so I've included that. But uh, yeah. Um, one of the things um, I'm really curious about, and I think we, we all just a little bit of text talking about this, we'd love to, to hear something, one of your responses to the prompt, if that's. Well, I prepared, actually I did four. Oh, fantastic. Well, well, but that's okay. If you want to hear 10 minutes worth, which is a long time, and I can do that because I'm ready, but uh, you want to do that I'd, now? I'd love to. Fine. Okay. Since everybody's muted, they can say, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, okay. So starting with the first prompt in 642 stories to write, I've written 15 short stories in eight months averaging about 3,000 words. The second prompt became a novel. All are on my website, dougfortier.com, along with more than 50 other short stories and two essays. I have 10 of that list with five of five stars and three with two stars. So here are the summaries of four of them. In the stories online, the prompt isn't revealed until after the story ends, but I'm going to do it up front. So I picked uh, two five stars bracketed by two four stars. So prompt number eight, this isn't my real name. The only person who knows my true name is my only living relative. I titled it, Wilmetta isn't my real name. It's written in the first person with a millennial woman as the protagonist. She'd worked for the CIA as a remote viewer. It's an ESP variant. And I've been given the name Wilmetta. Being a lab rat didn't suit her and they relocated her to Reno where she shot a man who pursued her aggressively and attempted to abduct her. She and her sister fled to San Jose where she became Archer. But the dead man's brother had been watching what happened to his brother and followed them there. Ultimately, he acts like his brother and Archer sets up a confrontation at the story's end where she points the pistol and screams her demands, then has him hold out his ear. She blows a hole in it. He faints and later sends her a card from another state. So, um, Prompt number 10, you hear strange voices in your head. They tell you to do good things. I've titled it, The Way of the World. It's also written in first person, but with a middle-aged woman of leisure narrating as an arranger of contract killings. She's using burner phones until Don Fazio connects her with Polly the Putz. She set, he sets her up with an internet anonymizer that strips the sender's identification from email messages. Then along with the next contact done the old way, she tells them what to do. Then she hears a voice in her head telling her to do good things. It also tells her that money isn't everything and that she should visit her uncle in Florida and her aunt in upstate New York among other good deeds. The feds come for her. When her lawyer calls Polly because she suspects him, she's told that he said, when I arrived at her house, a voice in my head told me to do good things. So prompt number 13 is, I'm the only one here who doesn't speak the language. It gives me a unique perspective. It's titled, What Could Go Wrong? A haute couture designer from New York 
is recruited to work for a year in Shanghai in a Shanghai fashion house. Again, in first person, this late 40s woman is beset by the three other designers. Nan Rossi must use visual cues, <clears throat> voice intonation, and body language, among other things, to interpret what's going on. She has a translator, but only for a short part of the weekly status meeting. Nan's copies of her portfolio are stolen along with her new work. Instead of firing the other three designers, the head of the design team threatens that he will if this kind of thing continues. Then her second portfolio copies and Nan's new work are stolen from the metal, the new metal and locking file. Daye Shu Min blows up, fires the three, and together he and Nan interview candidates. They work together, they work well together, and she finishes her year. Okay, last one. Prompt 12. This is one of my favorites. I think some of my best writing. I do say so. The kindergarten teacher wore a rabbit mask during the entire first week of school. Process that one. <laughs> I titled it FaceTime. It's predictable that this is first person and a woman who's 23, but this woman is being treated for schizophrenia and lives with her mother in San Francisco. She witnesses an event that precipitates and focuses her disease. A friend's rabbit is having kits, and this unnamed protagonist sees the mother crunch the skull of a newborn and eat it. Blood oozes from the rabbit's mouth, and her front teeth become smeared with it. The woman's dreams are of a jaguar chasing her, terrorizing her. But even though the cat's eyes are the same, its face is that of the bloody rabbit's. She doesn't like the side effects of the Helperidol, stops taking it, ends up on city streets where she sees the rabbit's face on people. She knocks one down and kicks the person's head until bystanders pull her off. The police book her and take her to a psychiatric hospital. There is much more to the story, but it ends with the main character teaching kindergarten back on her meds, but still fearful of seeing these new faces, she appears with the rabbit's mask she's made and tells them, I am one of you. They all see it as a game. She continues wearing it through the week, then returns on Monday without it. So. Thank you so much for sharing those. Glad I could. Very daring with the not what I expected with the rabbit mask. No. And lots of lots of plot twists and turns. No. Thank you so much. Doug, one of the things that I was fascinated with with your stories is that they're in this really wide and very deep um, array of, of fields, like the one with the person who's in design. Yeah. Right? So yeah. And I know that as a writer, whenever I'm um, sort of writing fiction, that one of my favorite things is actually about learning about a new field that I have to know to be able to be convincing, right? And finding out, you know, what are the processes? What are the tools? What are the objects that people use? That sort of thing. So can you talk a little bit about that in your process? Oh, boy. We're talking about how my, how my imagination generates things, my creativity. Um, I do it a step at a time. So in the case of not speaking the language, well, <clears throat> I first picked something that I, I had some knowledge of, which was, well, no, not knowledge of. I know that there are these haute couture designers in New York City. So I did some research on that. And then I decided that China would be a place where she wouldn't have any idea. It's not one of the romance languages. And so she goes there. Well, she's invited. She's headhunted by uh, the design house. And anyway, it was offered triple her normal pay for the year to go there and she can't refuse. So on and on and on. But uh, as far as how I do it, <laughs> you should read some of my other stories on my website. Um, I have a, 
a wide variety of things from a sentient house that takes care of the family and is dying. That's in one page. Um, on and on and on and on. But um, I love it. I, this is my joy. I, I have a regular writing time every morning and I stick with it. It's become a habit. Uh, it's the only way to do it as far as I'm concerned because I wasn't writing otherwise. So um, yeah, and I like the research too, so. Do you have any writers who influence you or who inspire you? Um, well, not really. I could, well. See, now I'm drawing a blank on anybody's name. That's okay. <laughs> but, uh, that's okay too, yeah. Um, I'm in a critique group and I know that Malcolm signed on and Donald is here, uh, maybe Art too. So we have great fun with it um, and other contributions. So that's good. But uh, as far as influence, um, I have to have thought about this ahead of time. Oh, that's okay. I, I just know that in my practice, many times when I need inspiration besides prompts is I actually read other, a lot of other people. Yes. And, you know, and their writing always inspires me. So. Well, yeah, I do a lot of reading, certainly. Um, and anyway, that makes Doug, a big difference. Um, I'm sorry, I just have to say, you talked about the sentient house. I don't know how many of you have seen the new animated movie Encanto. It's, it's basically about an animated house that takes care of, of everybody, so. Yeah, well, not animated, but alive. So yeah, it, it, um, what was so the you're in the you're you you're in the zeitgeist. You've I guess you tapped into something. But in Canto, I haven't seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's quite good. Yeah. So I have a question: Is are, are people? Is there anybody out there going from the first prompt and taking the next challenge and writing? Writing, writing. Any of you three know? I've seen people start that way, or I've seen like on Twitter or reviews, people say they're doing that. Yeah. I wouldn't say I've seen anyone show determination to do them all or to finish. Yeah. Well, I hope I live that long. I have <laughs> a degenerative lung disease that, uh, it's not a good prognosis, let's say that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Sorry to hear. Well, I, I think I agree. I think that you're the only one that I know of that is determined to go through them. How many have you done so far? You may have said. Well, 17. Seven. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, eight months worth, pretty much every two weeks, but... Uh, if I wrote longer, I could get more done, I'm sure. But right now, I'm happy with the, the balance. Slightly easier version would be 642 tiny things to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know Are if you're I just writing a paragraph, and then there's another one. Yeah, well. Uh, well 642 lists to write. Mm -hmm. And since almost everybody makes a list every day, whether you're going to grocery shopping or trying to remind you of something, uh, writing lists can somehow like you it probably that would probably probably take you uh 321 days rather mm -hmm. than uh yeah. that uh i think all told between the six books it's over four thousand writing prompts wow yeah one of the things that i was also mentioning and chandra and po maybe po knew this but chandra didn't but it's all over the world. I, um, I travel a lot. And um, a couple of years ago, I was actually in London uh, for a while over the holidays and went to Serpentine Gallery because uh, I'm an artist and frequently just go to all of the major galleries. And I was with my, um, my partner and my son and I'm like, oh my God, you guys look at this. And sure enough in the Serpentine Gallery an art gallery bookstore was 642 things. <laughs> I'm like, it's like, wow, that is so cool. 
Yeah, I have to say too, as um, I teach screenwriting and um, I, I use prompts a lot in classes. I'm sure you probably do too, JD, or something similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember at the time, I think we, it was 2010, 11, we were, I think we were, I was in the middle of uh, producing um, our first feature film. And so it didn't feel like I was doing anything. You know, I wasn't writing, I was trying to raise money. And so it was really nice uh, to have that. I sort of jump on that opportunity to just think a little bit creatively. And it was the same for the, the subsequent ones that we did. Um, I think there were some, I remember other people who took on that role that you had, right, Poe? Um, like Jason, and then there were other themes like, uh, you know, I think it was 642 things to write about love. Things oh, I um, love about you. Oh, things I love about you. Yeah, I remember that one. Uh, that that one kind of got my juices flowing. I contributed um, a lot. So really that idea that being in this community, um, we were prompted <laughs> to think creatively. And the same thing, for example, just through the lift serve or through walking in the hallways when um, in the, especially in the early days of the, the festival, literary festival, Lit Quake, when there was a grotto night and people would say, well, this is a theme. Do you have, do you have anything written or can you write something by then? And so, um, having and I, I hope I'd love to learn more about how you function as a group but um, I hope as a community you can you share some of that um, you know that kind of electricity of prompting one another um, as well uh, I I know that I sometimes can be very close to the chest with my work and um, not want to start until I know exactly where I'm going and things like that. So sometimes just flipping through these prompt books and just saying, I'm going to write something. If I don't have the next thing on a script I'm writing, I'm just going to grab something. And um, so I, I do recommend this in other books for, for others of you. Um, yeah. Well, and Chandra, I think, um, what you were also saying about you know talking to other people and kind of like being made accountable so so doug i love that you said that you have a critique group because yeah. um both when i was you know when i am an artist although i don't have one right now i found as well as a writer i found found that having a regularly scheduled critique group gave me deadlines and goals that i would have to you know work towards i would have a commitment to work towards rather than sort of this abstract amount of time of an uncertainty, but I would actually have, it would set a deadline like, oh, I have to finish something by then because I have to read it aloud. I have to like talk, you know, I have to edit it so someone else will hear it and I won't be ashamed of it, <laughs> you know? Um, so in that way, you know, with the writer's grotto and even the 642 challenge was this wonderful deadline and prompt and collaboration. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I was actually curious about Chandra and Poe because I've never asked them directly because we didn't really talk about this was how what inspired your prompts like what inspired your process in terms of to think of these prompts because for me it was a mix of real life and you know just sort of thinking what I would be interested in hearing a story about and, and I actually dug up um, the prompts that I submitted for this book that you used Doug I found them in my files and one of the things that I found what a prompt that I submitted I don't know if it ever made it into the book but it was while sitting at a work picnic, your character asks her boss, her boss's wife, when her due date is due. And the answer is, I'm not pregnant. Uh -huh. I'm like, <laughs> so that happened to me. <laughs> I went to a work party <laughs> and someone, uh, and the, the wife of one of my bosses came and she looked very large in front and she was wearing one of those maternity overalls. And, and we were in the elevator and I said, so when's your due date? Oh, <laughs> um, I know, I know. And it's like horrified, of course, right? How do, how do you get out of that? But anyway, so 
Sandra and Poe, how how you how are you two inspired for some of your prompts? You go first, Poe. So I'm I'm gonna look mine up, my specific prompts, you know. I, I actually don't remember, especially for this this book. Um I I did kind of flip through a little bit to see if any of them were like, oh, that one was mine. Um, and I'm I'm not really sure. I know that just from what works for me usually is trying to find some kind of um, something that's really tense, like what you just said, um, JD, or something that um, reveals vulnerability or one of the things that I use a lot for um, my screenwriting students is you know how do you get something across without saying you know so that people are working more in terms of uh, visual language but as I was flipping through I I saw one I it, it might have been mine it seems like something I would have written but I don't know but I like it um, and this one is uh, a translator doesn't want to translate what she's just been told. Um, and I, again, I'm not sure it could have been mine just because I thought a lot about translation and I've seen that happen and heard of it. Um, so, you know, just something that um, makes makes your characters squirm or even makes uh, the writer squirm a bit I think is always good okay Sean uh Chandra um here's some and then consider that um the conceivably these also could have come from David but so I'm not super clear because I've grew oh you mean you found the ones that I sent this is from the very original one in December oh, second, two thousand eleven. Excellent. I'm curious. <laughs> but but I think if you remember, like, uh, if we were doing money, I would send stuff to you, not to David. So I think <laughs> but here you go. Um, define brevity in brief. <laughs> That's one. A soundbite from you meeting your doppelganger. A note in a bottle you found washed up on the shores of Disney World's Lake Buena Vista. Describe, <laughs> describe Earth to an ADD space alien. Um, awards you won today for mundane achievements. <laughs> the menu for your last meal. A Beatles song as rap lyrics. And this one's interesting. A sympathy card for the devil. <sighs> a different topic, but I'd like to hear. Um, Thank you. With Go being, with being um, uh, banned in Ohio, the school in Ohio. Yes. Yeah, so um, we actually got a. Um, copy of a newspaper article. Isn't that how we learned about it, you guys, I think? Um, that, yes, uh, someone saw it on the news somewhere. Yeah, where apparently a teacher uh, and I, um, offered the book as a um, prompt, you know, set of prompts for a senior high school literature class. And one of the parents um, happened to get hold of the book and found some very sort of racy, sexually oriented situation prompts and threw up a huge protest and um, asked the, um, you know, asked that the teacher who assigned these prompts in the book to their students be, you know, fired and wanted to get rid of the entire school board. Um, I'll find the link and I'll put it in the chat. But it just created this whole ruckus, and then it actually made the national news <laughs> because you know so many um, because it was sort of an interesting again censorship of the book. And to be fair, the prompts that were complained about by this parent were were you know were probably a little advanced in terms. They were of, adult. Yeah, they were adult. Yeah, they uh, they were as Sean just says they were adult. They were meant for um, you know people who were not in seniors in high school who had a lot of sexual activity going on, you assume, <laughs> but for, for adults. 
And so in that sense, um, you know, I think the protest was understandable, but also I think, you know, seniors are very close to college age. Yeah. I should add that it actually was a college course. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's a it good point. A college course, college that, you know, some, course. Some high school students can take call local community college classes. Um, but just taking doing a quick Google, there's um, headlines like Ohio High School seizes books, police investigate college course writing prompts. Um, and I mean, I, I could look up some of the prompts. They were adult, but they were just basically, we were thinking of adults, people who have had sex, maybe have had beer. I think one of them was like, you know, how how do you speak differently when you're drunk or, you know, something like that. Um, but we certainly didn't have uh, kids in mind. And then there's another headline, um, uh, controversial writing prompts book went unnoticed for five years. <laughs> um, this is all uh, local, you know, but we, it, it did actually, it is something I'm on the teaching committee. And one thing that has come up is um, we have started to offer um, a couple of writing classes for teens and for kids. And we've had to think about what, what is appropriate. And I've had high school students um, or usually their parents first write me and say, can my kid take your class, you know, in the evenings after school. And I'd never really thought in terms of anything problematic, but just to say, well, you know, we're studying Brokeback Mountain or there's just so you know that there are movies with adult themes and never been an issue, but it, we're, we're more, more conscious of that, I think now. I think it's um, interesting also is that regarding this high school, there is a young writer's edition. Yeah. So after we did our six series, Chronicle Books, intelligent publisher they are, was like, let's do this for kids. And so they worked with our friends uh, at 826 Valencia, which is uh, originally from San Francisco and spread across the country, heavily focused on younger writers through teenage years. And they did a whole series of books as well as the ones that we had done, all for young writers. And, you know, when I hear a story like this, we were asked to comment for the media. I didn't really see anything worth adding, honestly, but I did find myself as a writer trying to sympathize and empathize with, well, how did this happen? sort of. And it is interesting about our original book, because this is, in fact, the original book that they were that they were teaching, not any of the other ones in the series. Um, the, the ability to have point of view and perspective and to imagine things and to stretch your brain was, you know, it's just throughout the book. And if there's anything you're trying to do with teens is to get them to not just navel gaze, right, is to be able to put themselves in the minds of others. And they go through a cycle that peaks around 14, 15 of sort of very, very inward focused, very focused on them, and you're trying to pull them out of it. And I imagine like this uh, high school, easily every, every year when they went to Amazon could have been prompted with, you sure you don't want the young writers editions <laughs> to high school, you know? And I'm sure they're like, no, this book is the one that's working. And they used it year after year because they saw an impact on the positive impact on the children who did it. Uh, even if it meant imagining, I think there's like four or six prompts that were offensive, sexual things that that they had no experience with, but could push, push their mind into. And uh, it's sad, these things are, these things are sad, but um, it wasn't like Chronicle Books hadn't thought of this problem 
and <laughs> created a whole series of solutions for it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's gone down. It's not like other schools. It's not like continuing in a chain reaction across school districts. Well, and one of the pluses was it actually brought up a controversy where many parents wrote in to say they disagreed. Um, I'm reading one of the articles uh, about it and, and the, the examples of the prompts are like, quote, write a sex scene you wouldn't show your mom. That's the prompt. And like the second one is, rewrite the sex scene from above, the one you just wrote, that you would let your mom read. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's basically about kids imagine, imagining themselves having sex and writing about it, which is a normal part of growing up. And, and you know, Chandra and Poe and I are all parents of teenagers. <laughs> Poe and I both have boys who are 18 years old and Chandra has two teenagers as well. And so we well understand the minds sort of the, and the level of thinking that teens have. And, you know, it's like, when I read those, I'm like, oh my God, do they know what kids, what their kids watch right. on Netflix? <laughs> do they realize how very well educated their kids are from Netflix and TikTok on sex? I mean, and, and, and so, you know, that, that, I think that was one of the other things that's going on. And then many other parents wrote exactly that saying, we don't understand because the controversy came from one of the parents framing the prompts as child pornography. And then the mayor got on board and called the school board to resign or possibly face criminal charges for distributing child pornography. And then the interesting thing is the prosecutor of that county said, no, this isn't child pornography. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was, again, this sort of spreading of this exaggeration and this rumor about what the book's really about. I, I found one, yeah, I found that, which I thought was really actually, you know, something I would certainly give teens. And then there was a comment from a parent that said, do not sexualize our kids the raw filth that snuck past the gatekeeping functions of this board of education in 642 reasons was disgusting. Um, I do think though, um, Poe, that unfortunately it, it, is, it did happen in a time when there's a wave of um, parents wanting to censor school districts. I mean, that is happening. It happened to uh, Grotto member uh, Julia Shear's um, wonderful memoir, which I highly recommend, Jesus Land. That was, there was an uproar um, in her native um, Indiana. I'm not quite sure where. Um, and, it, and it's just so odd because, um, you know, you read the book and you see that in no way is she, you know, it's very difficult situations that she talked about. Nothing, you know, uh, written to be salacious in any way, but it is part of something that's happening um, in the United States. And apparently was one of the ways that the Virginia governor uh, race was, was sort of tilted, was parents wanting more control over what is allowed in the schools in terms of what they have access to. We have a few more minutes. I wonder if there are questions that people want to ask. There's been a lot of interesting chat and I encourage people to look at it. Comments for Doug and as well as um, about the books. So any questions? I can't see Howdy. hands very well. Oh, Naughty, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, while this has been going on, I took your advice and I uh, used the writing prompt of lists. So I wrote a shopping list and um, that contains some very strange phenomena, which uh, I always appreciate, but it, it uh, such as uh, uh, mustard grown in the vineyards early May, crystal meth for the casserole, Mary's mm -hmm. gone quackers, gluten isn't free, situations I can find useful, cream comma of the crop or otherwise so uh, it's I being, love able, that. being able to being able to think about um it from that point of view which it's just not something i would do now doug shame on you you sold another copy of the book <laughs> Good. Good. i love that i think that um what you point out is that um we it's hard for many people to have that 
you know, that one hour or more than that every day to, to write, but we write in our daily lives all the time. So I'm inspired by what I just heard to next time I write, um, you know, to go downstairs on the fridge for the family grocery list and, uh-huh. and get creative, you know, because it's, it's in our daily lives. Yeah. Yeah. The original book had some prompts and then full blank pages for full-on stories like the one that Doug is working from where it's 642 full stories but the Roger one really had a mix and it had ones where there would be four on a page here's one from JD where all you had to write was one sentence right again it's what Chandra said just a prompt to get you writing just do it like you can't possibly say I don't have time to write one sentence you know so uh and jd would do these quartets where here's a similar scenario with slight differences and look how the sentence changes as a result so give us the first sentence of how these stories begin you're one you're walking down a quiet street and you notice a body lying in the gutter you don't know if the person is dead or alive two you come across that same motionless body and you notice a wallet sticking out from under it. Same scenario, now it's a gun sticking out. Okay. Or um, uh, she would do these advancing ones where she'd, she'd tell you the prompt and you can imagine the story. Now she tells you a little more about what's happening in the story and asks you to start all over again. Um, and there's these lovely ones to, to, to probe the tension of longing and relationships, you know, the letter in your office. Mailbox is from your high school boyfriend, your first true love 25 years ago. What the hell? Or because we would use the way that we, we all used a way that uh, where writing appears in everyday places and we don't think about it as crafted prose, but it is. So this is from the form of an email. Um, write the first line, the first line, that's all you got to do. No one, everybody has time to write the first line of an anonymous, anonymous email to the wife of the man you know is having a destructive affair with your best friend. Mm-hmm. or from the narrative form of an obituary write a paragraph from your exit obituary Great. wow po thank you <laughs> so so i also wanted to reveal that and also maybe prompt all of you that these prompts come from things that happen to you in your everyday life. I mean, that you know will come out of the blue and like, wow, did that just happen to me? So I actually did come across a, what I believe was a dead body lying in a gutter <laughs> when I was visiting LA once and I didn't know if the body was dead or alive and I actually called the police, but that inspired that. Um, I actually did get a letter from my high school boyfriend who let, now lives in Osaka, Japan. <laughs> And I know Poe's laughing because he's like, oh, <laughs> and that inspired that prompt. Um, and what was the second one that you read? The, oh. uh, the, then there was the, um, there was the obituary of an ex. And before oh. that was the body line. So the last one was an obituary from an ex. Okay, well, that one, that one didn't happen to me, but my ex had this very um, colorful, career and was very, very publicly humiliated because of an affair he had while he was married to me. So, um, cause he was a pretty high up um, administrator in a college. Ironically, something just happened today with the president from Michigan and I was reading the newspaper. I'm like, wow, that just sounds like what happened to John <laughs> which was my ex <laughs> when his affair went public and it was national news cause he was such a high administrator in his college. And so that's who, that's what prompted that was like, hmm, because I'm always curious about 
obituaries, you know, it's because people die and they, they always want to frame people in the best light. And my, my thought has always been, wow, if you only knew, right? There have been some great, hilarious, brutally honest um, obituaries in the last few years that kind of become viral and, and I adore them. Well, and, and I think the thing, I, one of the reasons why I asked both Poe and Chandra about what inspired you is because very much things that happened to me in real life that stayed with me is what prompted a lot of my prompts. And um, in terms of, wow, you know, what was, what is the story that I would write based on this just happening to me and, and the background that led up to it and what happened afterwards. And to me is, you know, is very rich. I'm looking at the original manuscript and as we're at time and I've got to go uh, help my high school senior daughter with something. I want to offer one prompt that I think uh, everybody could do because um, we're all at Zoom somewhere uh, and we all have something in our house, maybe it's in our basement uh, that we should throw out, but we just can't. what is it and write about it <laughs> love it's it beautiful right. because because to me like my wife would probably point at something I, I i know exactly what i'd point at it's in the next room i've been asking her to throw it out for a long time or at least put it in the place in the garage uh can't do it you know and i think this talismanic capacity of physical objects to stir memory and feeling is and 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 echo across time frames is such a powerful good con but concrete thing to start about because we're all looking for writing to have this concreteness and these transcendent qualities so if you're wondering for one thing to do the rest of your day don't throw it out that's a great way to end thank you very yeah. much we all really appreciate if if we were unmuted we would all applaud oh thank you very much. Everybody. we'll stay around for you know if there's some people who want to talk we'll stay around but thank you very much for coming it meant really a lot to us and thank you doug for all you've done thank you doug thank you so wonderful to meet you all it was. especially you doug and and susan and all of you i'm really looking forward to some news of um your your continued progress on those prompts doug yeah, there you Oh this is yeah this was Before so the grotto great. people leave i just like to suggest you could get a lot of good prompts from this uh parent it's more of this critical race theory crap it's it's parents that in my opinion cannot move forward to where we would hope to be right now and they still want uh pure it's the puritans rising again i think you've got a lot of prompts you could come out of that and um that we could find a lot of writing material in that whole issue I, I, I hope you take it on and send it to us. I want to read it. Great to Everybody. meet you all. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Well.